referred to as Muslims, but the religion itself is not Muslim. It is Islam. It seems this religion is as misunderstood as its name. They teach about a God whose name is Allah, who loves, who has compassion, and who is holy. Yet many of this religion's members have desires to kill off others who don't agree and believe with them. It has even been reported that they have killed themselves while trying to kill off others. I heard a rumor once of them even flying airplanes into buildings, killing themselves as well as those whom they refer to as infidels. It seems like the great reward for all of this sacrifice is sex with virgins. Then I heard of another religion. And it's called Hinduism. And these believers think that they can come back to life in another form. And it's called reincarnation. And the ultimate goal to come back is a cow, which I thought was strange because most other humans eat those. Then I heard of a religion called Buddhism. These believers talk about something called karma. And they also hold to the teaching of reincarnation. And their ultimate goal in life is to achieve something called enlightenment. And then I heard of a religion called Christianity. In this religion, these followers talk about someone named Jesus Christ. In a book they call a Bible that points to a relationship that they are to have. In fact, many of them get upset when you call what they have a religion. They declare it's a relationship. Now I followed some of these believers around for a while to see what this Christianity was really all about. And here are my findings. Some, though not all, read from the book called the Bible. Though many don't follow it. Some, though not all, pray on occasion, but almost all of them pray when they're in trouble. Some, though not all, go to church, which has become nothing more than a building, unless something more important comes up, and then they are found there. There are many different colors in these buildings and many different colors of people who go to them. In fact, some of these churches in these buildings have large crowds and some have small crowds. Some have loud, fast music with lots of instruments and lots of people, while others chose not to have any music at all. Some have a man who stands behind a pulpit and preaches, while some have a woman. Even some have young adults who preach. Seems there are often arguments among many of these different churches. They seem to disagree more than what they agree. I even noticed in one church that I went to, there were arguments and disagreements even within the people of the same building. No way. <laughs> I even overheard two of them talking about the man who was in charge of preaching. It seems they were not very pleased with what he said, and they were trying to figure out a way to do something about it. After the service was over, I decided to go home or to go out to lunch with these group of Christians. They said some sort of prayer just before they all ate. And just as they were about to eat, some other Christians from one of these other houses came in and nobody said hi to one another. And I thought that was odd. And after we were done, I went home to visit with these people at their house and they were watching some sort of a visual box. And on it was a movie with violence, sex, and bad language according to their Bible, yet they continued to watch it. When it was dinner time, these Christians who like to eat, for some reason, didn't say a prayer at home before they ate. And then the husband and wife began to get in an argument, which I thought was pretty strange because the message that morning earlier was on the topic of love and forgiveness. And I believe that preacher also mentioned gossip and complaining, which is what I remember those other two people doing. Seems like this religion of Christianity talks about being good, but most of its members really don't try to be good all the time. Most of them are so busy that going to church has just become a part of what they do rather than a priority in what they do. Thus concludes my findings. That may be harsh, but if we want to check ourselves, I think somewhere along the line we all probably have fallen victim to something that was said there at one point or another. Now I know that none of us are perfect and we, we struggle to live up to being a Christian. 
We, we, there's a lot of struggles that go into this. And I think one of the things that sets Christianity apart from all the other religions is that great struggle. It would be easy just to do works. It would be easy just to be a part of a program. Come on. It would, come on. It would be easy just to do something and have that be all that is needed, but to actually walk in a relationship with God who created everything. Come on. I, I don't know about you, but you talk about something that's pretty intense. To live and walk in a relationship with the Creator of everything versus just doing a program or reading a book or acting out something. I know none of us are perfect and we have situations that come up that stretch us to the point that we don't really act like we know we should act. Amen. But I want to talk this morning about the number one point. Are we really living out the Word of God in our life this morning? That's what I want to, that's what I want to present to you. Are, am I really living out the Word of God? Is it really alive in me? And am I really am I really putting an effort to live it? Because when I do, I've discovered that I plug into a life, I plug into a race to run that is different than what I thought I would run. I used to live a certain lifestyle and I realized that that was a counterfeit lifestyle to what God had planned for me. I was involved in things outside of an awareness of who God is. And when I came into a relationship with God, I began to realize that there are some things that God had for my life and some things that I was involved in didn't fit into that plan. And I think that's what wearies us. That's what gets us drugged down. That's what causes us to get tired when really we're not. He says, take upon me my yoke. Cast, cast your burdens on me and put on me Put on you my yoke. And I want to tell you, when we do that, we can run the race the way that we're supposed to run the race. And we can have the endurance we're supposed to have. Can I get an amen? Yeah. If we're tired, it might be because we're dragging around some extra stuff as we're trying to run this race that we shouldn't be dragging with us. Hebrews 12.1 says this, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside... Everybody say, put off. Put off. Every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run the, with endurance the race that is set before us. Get rid of the stuff that doesn't go with us. Well, Peter, I'm thinking I'm, I'm going to take some of this with me. Come on, I'm going to take some of that with me. I don't want to give this up yet. God, I want to serve you. I want to run for you. I want to praise you. I want to give you glory. But I also want to keep some of this stuff with me. Come on. God says lay it aside because it causes you to lose your endurance. Come on. We have a race that we are called to run. We have a life that you are called to live. You don't just get saved and everything can just you know, become about you after that. When we surrender our life to Jesus and walk in salvation, we're saying, God, everything I own, everything I have is yours. Amen. There is no other way to live in the kingdom of God than under total surrender and submission saying, it's all yours, God. God says, love me with everything you got, not some of what you got. That's right. Yeah. And when you do, I am here to promise you, when you do run that race that way, your life opens up and all counterfeit lives, all counterfeit races, all other things, they are taken away and you get to see with full vision and glory the wonderful things that God has for you. So how do we do this? It's, one, it's great to hear that, but how do you do it? It goes on in Hebrews 12, verse 2. He says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame. He is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I'd like to declare it's time we put our focus back on the King. Not on church. Not on preachers. Right. Not on books. Not on DVD series. Not on teaching. We put our eyes on the author and finisher of your faith. Not mine. Not the one sitting next to you. Not the next church down the road. But on the author and finisher of your faith and the calling. I want to tell you the only way you can tap into that is in.